All right, well, I, I'm excited to get the program started again. We have uh, Ryan Lockhart, who's going to be talking about business and enterprise agility. He, he has a story about how we as DevOps practitioners can talk better with folks who are focusing on the business parts of an organization. Ryan uh, came over here from Philly to talk to us. Uh, he works as a consultant, a technology consultant with an organization called Contino. Please welcome Ryan. How's everyone doing? So I have to admit, I'm still adjusting to this whole con Ryan is a consultant thing. Uh, it's th the first year of doing that, so I've always been in the enterprise up till now. Um, so as we get into this, I just want to make sure you guys understand, I am impossible to be offended. So if I say something that uh, bothers you, if I say something you like, throw a hand, throw a pen, throw a book, whatever you want to do, just stop me and, I, and we'll talk about it. If we go off the slides, we go off the slides. I, I have a timer, so I'll try to stay as close to that as possible. Um, like Warner said, I, uh, I, I work for Contino. You saw my uh, partner, Adar, speak yesterday, and we're pretty passionate about this stuff. So we're going to go through it in, uh, in a, an assemblance of a reasonable pace here. The, the intention of this talk today, uh, we're going to cover a couple different things. I know that most people here are practitioners in the DevOps space, but what I want to do is I want to frame what that means uh, for, from my perspective. When I talk about DevOps, what does it mean? Because I think everybody kind of has a, a, a separate definition. Um, won't take too long on that because you all are pretty aware of it already. Um, then I want to kind of shift and say when I talk about business agility, what does that actually mean and why does that matter? Uh, then we're going to talk about a shared syntax. How can we actually communicate with the business partners that are feeding the requirements into the pipelines that we're working with? Uh, talk about an operating model that actually supports both the, the business agility aspects of the commercial side of the business and the technology piece of how we actually deliver code and applications into production. And then last but not least, I'm going to quickly, if we have time, talk about a quick case study where all of this kind of blended together uh, from, from the field. So. Does that look good? Everybody happy so far? Nobody's throwing a thing? Nobody's going to, someone's going to take me up on that one day and I'm actually going to have to duck. All right. So when I talk about DevOps, the first and um, most important thing for me to say is it's, it's, we tend to, especially from the enterprise stance, it breaks down to people, process, and technology. And with the large enterprise companies that we tend to work with, which of the three do you think they try to solve first? Technology. Yes. Technology, throw money at the problem, the problem solves itself. However, when I think about DevOps, that's actually the third leg of the stool. We want to start with the people. We want to understand what the, the design of the organization is. How do these people interact with each other? What skills do they have? What skills do they not have, right? Let's figure out what the, uh, the balance of that is. And how do they actually work today? How do they interface? Are we a uh, email happy company? Do we only talk over phone? Do we only talk over Slack? Co-located, distributed, whatever that, whatever that is. Next, we want to talk about the process. How do these people actually take one line of code and push it into a production or a production-like state? Um, what are the KPIs that we use to measure the, 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 um, the people against and, and the process itself? And then, you know, just like we talk about, DevOps has about a billion different definitions. Lean, Agile, Waterfall, um, the uh, ITIL, whatever the other processes are that govern the, uh, govern the, pro uh, the flow of, of work fall into the process. And then we talk about technology, that's really the infrastructure, the architecture, the application delivery, the tool set, uh, all of the things that, you know, as DevOps practitioners, we're, we're pretty, pretty close to and we, we're pretty well aware of. But these three things are really what take up the overall landscape of what um, DevOps culture is. And to actually make sticky change within a large enterprise, you actually have to be aware of all three and you have to be moving the needle with all three. You cannot do it with technology alone. The way I like to look at DevOps, it's a concierge service for us to deliver value to our users, right? Business agility is the ability for organizations to make pivoting changes in the business strategy and tactics. So when we talk about business agility, it's really the, the product folk, right? The, the general managers, the project managers, whoever it is that, that has the decision-making power in that organization 
to sense a change in the market or the product and respond to it with prioritization, road mapping, or other decisions to pivot or, or pursue. There are also, uh, business agility really requires the ability to adopt strong configurations and um, more cost-effective ways of working, right? Hopefully, as I was writing the slide, the idea is, oh wow, this doesn't sound that much different than what we do with DevOps. So the main focus points in business agility really are the organizational design, the, the market disruption, and the product innovation. Again, super strong parallels into what we do with DevOps, right? Nothing too wildly different here. The problem is we have no shared line of sight into each other, uh, or we, we struggle with it sometimes, especially in very large organizations because we have cubicle walls, we have hierarchies within the, um, the organizational design. So what we say is one can actually say that the, the business agility is the outcome of the organization's inte organizational intelligence. I look at that and I usually think of, okay, so business agility uh, that speaks to Conway's law, but for the prioritization of product. So for organizations to really adopt a true business agility mindset, there's a couple things that are, that's needed. You can't just go into it with a hope. I mean, that, the hope is a strategy never works, but it holds true here as well. So really what you need is high fidelity input sensors. Um, I, has anyone ever worked with a product team that seems to base their strategy off of what they think or they feel? <laughs> Damn it, I thought I was alone. All right. So, it's really scary sometimes when organizations go through like these Silicon Valley product group type trainings or they bring in pragmatic marketing or you actually get a visionary leader that says, we're no longer gonna be making our decisions from the, the tip of the seat of our chair, we're actually gonna get out of the building and we're gonna go out there and we're gonna start talking to people. And to me, that's literally step one. Going and asking somebody what their problem is or what it is that they want, they're gonna give you answers and you're gonna make product-based decisions off of those answers, the problem is, they don't often know what they want, but when you ask them a question, they'll give you something back, and if you use that as your core sense of strategy, you're actually missing quite a bit. Um, so within DevOps, what we do is we, we tend to build those quick feedback cycles, and those, those, we start instrumenting the code, we start putting in ta analytics and tagging, and we start making uh, smaller incremental releases to the production system that allows for more meaningful feedback loops. Um, we also, uh, for business agility to make sense, you want to do micro bets. No more do we want to, we don't, we don't want to do those three, six, nine, 12 month releases where we put a whole lot of organizational capital into one giant guess. We want to start you know, putting out things faster and faster so that we get those, those feedbacks and we get val uh, validation of our hypotheses or we prove the hypothesis to be not true and we make a decision based off that. Oftentimes what you see are organizations that think a hypothesis is something that you prove to be true when it's actually meant to be something that is disproven. Um, also, uh, stable systems. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into this. Everybody in the room is probably super aware of how critical that is when you need to make business and strategic based decisions. And then uh, highly integrated teams, cross-functional teams, the ability to speak to the customer in a domain context that makes sense top down. So this is really where we kind of come together. So we now have an understanding of what DevOps is. We probably had that walking in the room. I appreciate you guys humoring me as I went through it one more time for you all. Um, and then when I talk about business agility, what does that mean? Because more and more you're seeing business agility creep up in the conference circle or in, in the executive rooms and the conversations I'm in, there's a lot of talk about how can we be more agile as a business and that's really what that means. So how do we interface the two, right? We have a group of professionals on the technology side that are hyper interested in a lot of the same things that we just talked about on the business side, but there seems to be a disconnect between them and a lot of the organizations that I work with at least. Actually, let me validate that. Am I alone in this, or do you guys sense there to be a chasm between the technology house and the business side? I mean, hands? All right, cool, so I'm not alone here. So how do we talk to each other then? Our language as DevOps practitioners is different, right? With a lot of the words that we use, a lot of the, the shared vocabulary is pretty unique. We talk about pipelines, we talk about platforms, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about infrastructure as code, and all of these things that put a layer of mystifi uh, mystification, go with that, give me a microphone, it's a word now. Um, we put a layer of mystery around these things, and it's good because we understand what it means when we talk to each other. We don't have to explain that, but as a business person, that can be threatening. And 
they don't necessarily understand what that means. And it also, it damn sure sounds like we're gonna start shifting the paradigm in which they work. Our intent is very similar between DevOps and business agility, but we don't know how to talk to each other. And oftentimes, I, I love this, we use JIRA as our communication interface, um, which it shouldn't be. So we need to find better ways of talking to each other is, is where this is heading. Stories, story points, and acceptance criteria, definition and done, definition, right? all this other garbage that we put in there just to make it seem like we're, we're creating harmony is always really just creating abstraction layers in the communication uh, standards. So how do we actually build this synergy? How do we actually build syntax? How do we actually build empathy? Um, we start with some domain modeling. How is the system actually supposed to behave, right? How do, it, what, me as a technologist and you as a business person, or me as a business person, you as a technologist, when I say thing X, what does that mean to you? And we actually start understanding then, oh, okay, so I've been developing this system against my understanding, which actually is in discord with your understanding or your intent. One of the best ways I know to draw empathy is using uh, pairing. Um, I'm not saying go grab a business person and have them start writing some tests with you, some unit tests. What I am saying is sit with them and understand how is it that they're coming up with the, the conclusions that they have. When I deliver something to a testing instance for them to look at, how do they start looking at it? Where do their eyes go? What, what do they think? What do they feel? What are they, what, what are they hearing, right? Sit with them as they go through some of the customer um, requests that come through their pipelines and how do they make those prioritization judgments and also invite them into some of the engineering practices so they know why we say some of the things we say and how, some of the things that we do. Most importantly, uh, how many people here would say that they're in an engineering cap uh, capacity in some form? Uh, just leave your hands up for a second. Bring your hands down if you talk to customers regularly. Okay, so quite a few, about 50% of the hands went down. I appreciate you guys hearing me. I, I don't really like when people say, you know, raise your hand, lower your hand, raise your hand. So I'm doing it to you. It's just horrible. Um, keep doing that. I mean, it doesn't really surprise me that folks that are coming to the DevOps days are in a position where they're, they're reaching out to their customer space. But you guys got to realize that's kind of an exception, not the rule. So if, if you're in an organization where you're not interfacing with the customer as much, start with talking incrementally get closer and closer to that voice of the customer. Um, doesn't matter how you do it or where you do it. I worked with, uh, I, before I came into the consulting space, I had a pretty large team that um, worked with me. I don't like to say worked for me, it's just disgusting. Um, and what I would do is I would have them shadow the uh, support, like the frontline support phone calls for, not for long periods of time because it's not super useful, but just drawing empathy from the customer who's trying to log into the system and is getting some problems. What are those problems? Going out on some sales calls, believe it or not, just sending them there not to speak most of the time, but just to listen and hear what the market is saying about what problems they have and, and how do we do that? Or how do we solve for those problems? The, the idea wasn't to turn these guys into support calls or these girls into uh, sales folks. The intent was really to draw empathy for the users and to then understand more from the business perspective when we make these decisions about um, where we're gonna put some unit tests or the next area of automation that we're looking to leverage or why have we not yet pulled in compliance as code. Like what, when we make these decisions or we make these, um, these judgment calls, we have more of a meaningful intent, right? And that intent is super important in our space. So what I want to do is I want to kind of step through an operating model. If you guys humor me, and this is where I'm going to start ducking some books, I hope. But I'm going to talk through how I've seen things work in my past and, and kind of how, we, how Contino, the company I work for now, has codified it. And it's not, I'm not presenting this because it's Contino's and I'm up here to sell anything. I'm literally showing you guys this because it works. It's actually been bred out of over 100 engagements that Contino's done. But for the 17 years that I was in the enterprise, this is very similar to how, like the, the process that I was working towards within my teams. Um, and I hope what you end up seeing is that this actually draws closer uh, the communication lines between the engineering house and the, the product house because I'm actually staging a bet here that as much as dev and ops started to blur the line between the two, the more we instrument and um, put tagging into code, I think you're gonna start seeing the, the blend between um, technology and product really start to merge in the, in the coming years. 
So the, the, the framework that we're going to go through, everybody says their frameworks are lightweight. This one is hyper lightweight, right? It, the intent is that it could, it's portable. You can tell I have ADD. I just see something over there. Um, <laughs> it's hyper portable. Um, it can fit into other, other larger heavyweight um, operating models. If you're an ITIL org, this fits in ITIL. If you're a safe org, God bless you, this fits in the safe, all of those things. Uh, it's built for scale. So with, I like to work with large enterprises. The only way that you're going to make an, an impact in the enterprise is if you prove something and it's scalable. You can take it from one team to many teams, sometimes hundreds or thousands of teams. Uh, the next is that it's holistic. And that, the, from the business agility talk perspective, if you are optimizing a silo, we're going to go lean theory here. If you're optimizing a silo, you're spinning your wheels, right? You need to optimize the whole system. The only way you're going to optimize the whole system doesn't necessarily mean that you're just talking the, the three tiers of the stack, but you also have to put in wrapper services around so that you're interfacing with those business people and you're inviting them into the change movement because you're fundamentally changing the paradigm in which they work, right? And I mean that because... I'm going to keep talking about instrument and code and uh, bringing metrics back in front of the product team. They're probably not used to that. They're probably used to that office-based decisioning and prioritization. So invite them in as early and often as you can. Uh, it's opinionated. Uh, it, it, it very much speaks to the fact that, that, that you have to take an engineering-first approach to the, the, um, the operating model because that, that's just where the industry is going. And measure... <clears throat> hey. Measurable. Um, Data-driven decisioning is super important, right? You do still have to layer in some of the subjective pieces from empirical learning, but Deming said it best, that which is measured is improved. So when you have a measured um, framework and model, you can actually start seeing what leverage you need to pull, what buttons you need to push, and which ones are being effective. So when you talk about those pivot versus pursue types deci type decisions, you actually have meaningful numbers to point to, and you can start talking in the language of business. Where is the value? And how can I demonstrate the value? Well, we're, we're releasing faster. What's faster mean? How much value am I getting from faster? So when you actually have something that, that pulls on those metrics, it's meaningful. Quickly stepping through this, um, there's five main aspects of this model that we're gonna see on the next screen here. It's, first of all, it's, it's, we wanna nurture it. And this is, it sounds simple, but it's actually difficult. This is when you get people with various different viewpoints coming together to talk about a large effort, right? Oftentimes, it's not even, this is, this is where you get to see the value stream mapping. You pull out the underbelly of the beast and you, you start creating that shared understanding of how, how we're gonna change something um, in the project. You'd have to do some lightweight planning just to you know, size it roughly. Uh, I'm not talking about a Gantt chart here. I'm just talking about you know, what, what are we talking about? What is the strategy? How is this aligned to the strategy? How big is the team and all that good stuff, or how many teams? Um, proving it is the space that I think a lot of us are familiar with. This is when we take these business objectives and these technology objectives, and we try to deliver them in a very lightweight model. We call this a, light, a lighthouse project internally. But it's something within the enterprise that we like to deliver in three months, right? And if you've ever worked in or with a large enterprise, you can't get business cases approved in three months. So delivering something to a production or production-like system in three months that's cross-cutting and, and is changing the ways of working is pretty significant. And I'm, I look forward to questions about that later. Usually get something there. It's scalable. Like, how, how do we take this now? Say we prove it in that Lighthouse project. How do we take that and, and in, introduce that to the enterprise level scale, right? Multi office, multi country, global, whatever it is, how do you take this then and spin it out and uh, across? And we'll talk about that for a little bit. And then um, we're gonna learn a whole bunch when we go through this. And if we did it right, that means we got a lot of things wrong. And how do we take those learnings and apply them back into the cycle, right? So I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I, I do wanna kind of build this out so you guys can see how this looks like on a, a, on a large picture here. And while it is kind of big, it's not overly oppressive. It's damn sure not the scaled agile framework for the enterprise, it's, it's much smaller and lightweight, and you can iterate through this a lot faster. So the first thing is really in that nurture it space, and I'm, just, I'm not gonna hit all of these because I don't have the time, but in the nurture it space, this is really where you get that problem alignment. You start building that shared syntax. You start building that shared understanding of what a problem is, and you can build the education piece. And it's not just technology educating the, the business. It's also the business educating technology about the intent of the application, especially if you don't have a whole lot of analytics and tagging up front. You do have to start from zero, and, and that's where you start building. Um, when we talk about the, the planet phase, that's really where you get the business case buy-in. Uh, 
We like to do a maturity assessment just to understand from a cross-cutting perspective, from a cloud and DevOps perspective, where are we starting? And then we go through and prove it out. We talk about the scaling. This is kind of where it gets cool because I can, I think, I'm going to be honest here, fact check me, go for it. Um, we've always been 100% effective in proving it because this is, this is not just the first time we're taking these enterprises through this. As long as we have a executive level sponsor that's helping us shepherd through the bureaucracy of a company, we can prove it in three months every single time. If we've engaged stakeholders, if we have um, that, that buy-in. Um, so then once we prove it, how do you then scale that proof? How do you build those proof points? And the idea is you take those same timed boxes, those three-month time boxes, because organizations have ADD as much as I do. I'm pretending that's not there. <laughs> and if you're not proving to them very regularly in three, four, five, some, five sometimes five-month cycles, that there's value in this process, they're going to forget, and they're going to revert to the shared learn uh, to the uh, the learned behavior that they've had for the last 30, 40 years that they've made billions of dollars on top of, right? So you need to continuously prove this in very small, digestible chunks. So you take these teams, uh, this team, and you do a seed and split method. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Restock that with more engineers that are now buying into this new way of working and this new value delivery stream. You also have to build in. Support systems, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of like centers of excellence, DevOps academies before, but this is really where you start giving people models, people and teams models to look towards. And that's not just like code libraries or lunch and learns or town halls, it's actually a way for both the business and the technology teams to come and get a good understanding of what better looks like, right? It's a, it's a way to home base. And last but not least is the improve it space. And, and really, I started working on a new graphic for this because it looks like improve it as the end, but that's actually, this should be a cycle. And we loop back. Once we have an improvement initiative, we go back and we try to nurture that and feed it through the system again. So it's actually a cyclical process. I'm gonna stop. Anybody have any questions or concerns so far? When you just mentioned that DevOps Academy idea, more than a lunch and learn, you're talking like over a series of weeks or it's, there's, it's a good question. So the question was, when I talk about DevOps Academy, is it over a series of weeks? Is it a one-time thing? To me, it's, it, it's, there's no straight answer. So I'm, I am a consultant now. It depends. Um, the idea here is you got to start with something. I mean, some of the organizations that I've worked with get pretty mature, and they actually build in an in-house learning management system that gives like a distributed learning. Other times, they, there's a very large bank that I think um, has some presence here in this area that has a tech college. And that tech college goes out and does like big learning sessions. So if you're starting a new project that's the first time your group is using um, Ansible and Packer, for example, they'll come out and do a tailored training for you on, the, on the, the tooling. Or if you have issues in your communication models, they'll bring in people that help with the facilitation. Uh, and they'll do a facilitation training. Right. I'll, I'll ask the founders. Just give me your email and I'll get it back to you. Uh, honestly, no. Um, Part of it is because it, it creates a beacon of light. Like if you think about the metaphor of a lighthouse, they're, they're usually put up on a coastline or in the, uh, the low tide areas so that the incoming ships have the ability to adapt to where they're coming so that they don't crash. And this is meant to give a, um, a beacon of light to the enterprise or to the organization about how can they get to better, right? How can they maintain safety and achieve better outcomes and not crash? So that's a great question. The question was, is the lighthouse usually greenfield or brownfield? Um, yes. So, <laughs> I mean, I think you and I actually spoke in the, in the circle yesterday. Um, I go back and forth which I prefer, to be honest with you, which is kind of crazy. I mean, green, green, greenfield seems like the better answer, right? Like, oh, you don't have any technical debt. You don't have any, um, you don't have any learned behaviors that you have to reverse. But Brownfield's kind of cool, too, because you already can start getting some learning from the system. You, you should have some degree of information, be it ServiceNow, JIRA, customer complaint tickets, so you know, oh boy. <laughs> you know, I almost needed somebody to punch. This isn't my laptop. I'm sensing and adapting. I didn't bring my adapter to the damn thing, so I'd use somebody else's, and I don't have the password. Um, <laughs> Brownfield's kind of cool, because it's already known to be a dumpster fire, and if there's a really good place to look good, it's to put out really big dumpster fires, and it's pretty easy to do that if you have some input into where the fire started, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly, well, think about it like this, right? 
if an organization is willing to invest into a brownfield project, that means there's a high degree of business value in that. Greenfield projects, until they've been proven in the market, are a guess, right? All right. I have six minutes and 35 seconds. Any other questions? Because we have a couple more slides here. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm going to give, uh, hopefully I'll give some time for questions at the end as well. So when we talk about scaling, these are the teams. These are like the Lighthouse Project teams that we're talking about. And those icons mean something. I didn't go through all that today. But just assume that means that you have highly available teams that are committed. Uh, they have a shared understanding and they, they have a common target that they're shooting towards. So the idea isn't that you just take that team and then say, oh, that worked, let's get a bunch more. You actually have to go through a, a meaningful seed and split methodology. But this, is, it, like, this graphic seems simple. You take one team, you make many. This is really difficult to do because you want to uh, nurture and respect the culture that was built in that first team. And when you scale it, that's when you start losing it. So you have to scale with responsibility and you have to make sure that there's good oversight and governance and you have those fundamental like DevOps academies and you have all of the support services built into your organization that make sure that you don't lose the traction that was gained. All right, so very quickly, I'm gonna tell a quick story. This, it, it's something that Contino did, but it just actually talks about how this actually applies at scale, okay? So Allianz, it's a very large uh, insurance company. I know that I'm standing in the shadows of a very large insurance company telling this that it's not Allianz, but um, we, haven't, we haven't done much there yet. So one of the largest, if not the largest in Europe, and they had an internal project team that was scoping out a two-year project and uh, multi-millions of dollars, and they were trying to break into this new market of um, small animal, and this one was particularly equine health, so horse health. Um, $300 million market, they wanted to get into it as quickly as possible. So we came in with the exact model I just stepped through. We got the business team talking to the, the technology team, and we said, we can deliver this in four months instead of two years. And you know that obviously stirred up the hornets, and everybody said, that's impossible. You're going to cut corners. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Thank God we got that executive sponsor I talked about. We actually got the CIO of Allianz to say, no, it's, you know, they're talking significantly cheaper dollars, it's worth the bet, we're gonna try this. And sure enough, in four months, we got them to enter the market, the same stance that they were looking for in two years, we got them in there in four months. We did that not just by Contino executing the project, we actually did it with Contino working with Allianz engineers at the same time, so there was a dual, up, uh, dual delivery and upskilling that happened over that period of time. 400% um, quick, that makes like a really good tagline if you're selling a book, right? I'm not gonna read all this, I swear to God I'm not. Um, but. The point of it is you can take that model and you can apply it to the largest insurer in Europe and you can go up against some very senior level um, objection stance people where they're they saying there's no way that's going to work. And nine times out of ten when you have people pushing back against your approach or pushing back against your mindset, it's not a technology argument. It's usually going to be a psychology argument because you're threatening safety. So the way that you address that is creating that shared empathy and that shared understanding, shared language, and start talking to those stakeholders in terms they understand. ROI is a very strong term that a lot of business people understand. So learn how your, your DevOps practices can apply to ROI. How can you get faster release cycles? How can you get mean, your, your mean recovery time down? How can you get cycle times to improve? And what does that actually mean in a business context, right? All right. So... I actually came in under, I thought I was going over. What questions do we have? Yay, Ryan. <laughs> Any questions at all? Does that mean I have to sing and dance for two minutes and 40 seconds or? <laughs> you don't want that. Thanks so much, Ryan. Oh, there is a question. C come up to the microphone, please. Go ahead. You want to take it? I know you said you're new to the consulting thing, but uh, from what you've perceived, how does your company get called into situations? Is it usually someone up top? hears of you, is it usually someone recommend you from the bottom, or do you have a sense of the diversity of how you get involved, or the so, buy-in? <laughs> there's, there, that's a multi-pronged answer. Um, I mean, we're very fortunate. We have uh, partnerships. We're, we're, as of this week, we're premium partners with AWS. Um, we have partnerships with HashiCorp, with um, 
with Docker and with Kubernetes. So when enterprises go to those websites, they usually see our name up there and they, they call us there. Um, but truthfully, there's quite a few of us, like Adarsh, my colleague spoke yesterday and I'm speaking today, we're, we're pretty much out there in the community doing these types of things and typically somebody comes up to us after these, they come and talk to us, or they, uh, they start seeing our white papers or they start hearing, like the, the Allianz story was shared in Computer Weekly magazine. Uh, the CIO himself wrote the article and once that gets out there and you start hearing those stories from, you know, from your client, like your clients start telling other clients, that reference point is probably the strongest, uh, strongest entry into a conversation like that. Is that did I answer your question? Cool.